Isaiah 35. Tonight I spoke on three road signs on Heaven's Highway. Three road signs on Heaven's Highway. I gave you those three signs. Anybody remember what they were? No parking was the last one, right? One way. One way was the first one. Narrow. Narrow way. A narrow way was number two. Three road signs on Hell's How on Heaven's Highway. What I preach means tonight. This morning I want to speak to you six road signs on Hell's Highway. Six road signs on Hell's Highway. We'll read these verses here in verse 8 and 9. Realizing this is, uh, spiritualizing this, uh, this phrase here. In verse 8 it says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err, err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Talk about heaven. Well, in hell, there's certainly not going to be any redeemed of the Lord. Amen. There's not going to be anybody who's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But hell's highway is for those originally uh, was found in the Word of God and was for um, the devil, uh, Lucifer and his fallen angels. But hell had to be enlarged. The Bible tells us that. We'll look at that in a few minutes. And therefore, because it had to be enlarged uh, be, uh, to take care of all the sinners who reject Jesus Christ, who commit the unpardonable sin, which is dying and rejecting Christ as their Savior. You know, Jesus preached on hell more than any other subject. Any other subject. More than love. Now the world like to tell you, oh, Jesus preached on love. Yeah, he preached on love. But he preached on hell a whole lot more than he preached on love. He preached on hell more than any other subject that he preached on. It says that Jesus came come to seek and to save the laws in Luke 19.10. He came to seek to save those that were lost. And therefore he told them about a literal lake of fire. He told them about hell and that it was a real place. And Paul, though, it's strange that we come across Paul's teachings. And it says Paul never preached on hell. And he never mentioned the word. Did you know that? Then you would think Paul, uh, a great man of God, the lead apostle, would certainly be preaching on hell, but he certainly never did. You know why? Because Paul primarily wrote to the churches. He wrote to the churches giving them instruction on dealing with problems in the church, like they had to do superiority. Uh, he dealt with people in the Corinthian church. It was a wicked church. I don't know why anybody would call their name Corinthian. For, you know, the Corinthian church or whatever. Corinth, church of Corinth, Corinth, Baptist, whatever. That's crazy. Undoubtedly, they don't know what happened in the book of Corinth. Uh, I believe I'd rather call it Philippi or something like that. Uh, but anyway, Paul never mentions the word hell and talks on the subject. Never does. But Jesus, in his ministry, preached on hell more than any other subject. And he also gives us, I believe in the Bible, I believe there are six road signs on hell's highway. We're going to deal with three this morning and three of them tonight, Lord willing. The first road sign that I believe that the Word of God gives us is... Um, is the word, this word here, is this road sign? Stop. Stop. Just plain stop. When a person in life is going down his path, God's put some things in his life to tell him to stop. To stop. When our girls were growing up, there were times I had to holler at my girls and say, stop. And I had to have them train because, you know, they'll run out in front of the car. When I was little, I believe it was in Cherokee, actually. And you know how busy the streets, and it was the busy time of year during the summer where everybody, well, the cars were bumper to bumper and, and people coming through there. And um, you know how little kids are, and I was like one of all little kids. They like to, you know, I was looking at Indians, and I believe, and all that kind of good stuff. And, uh, and it excited me because I was just a little boy because we had just 
either come or go, come back from, um, what's that thing in the sky? Uh, I forgot what you call it now. Ghost Town in the Sky, and I just saw um, the Cowboys and the Indians have it out on the train, and I remember all that. And, uh, so I was somewhere, and we had just come out of a store, and I had my eye on something, and I ran in between two cars and was fixing to run out into traffic. And my daddy said, Stop! And I stopped immediately in a car came by. And if I hadn't listened to my dad, I'd been run over, maybe killed. But my daddy's told me to stop, and I stopped. Well, God has some signs for a non-Christian to tell him to stop what you're doing. Stop going the direction that you're going because what's ahead you don't want. What ahead is not a party. What ahead is not going to be fun, I guarantee you. So God put some of signs in our path to, to tell us to stop. One of the things that God put in my life and I believe he puts in every uh, person's life is the cross. Is the cross. I thank God that my dad, when I was growing up as a little boy, I remember my daddy preaching on the cross. Maybe teach about the cross. This past couple weeks ago, we heard several messages on the cross. And when you get back to Calvary and what it represents about the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and that is a sign to us to stop what we're doing and confess our sins and kneel at the cross. <laughs> Brother Vicks preached on that when he get back to Calvary. We got to deal with that cross. And I believe that cross is a, is a stop sign for people that are lost. Every time they see a church steeple, every time they see a cross on a car or a, a shirt or something, that's telling them, hey, you need to deal with that sin. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to stop where you are and get it right or you're going to die and go to hell. That's what it represents. See, we don't want to deal with the cross. But we got to deal with that cross. I remember being in my mom's Sunday school class and again on that flannel board. I know y'all talk, I always talk about the flannel board. But I remember her having a big old rock up there and had the soldier standing there and there was a cross and had Jesus on the cross. And she was telling me when I was just a little boy about that cross and what it represented. And, and Jesus died in my place and he had my uh, uh, sins on him and he died for my sins. As a little boy, and she talked about the cross and, and what it represented and, and the one who died on the cross. Well, that was a stop sign to me it's before I got saved. But I need to trust Christ as my Savior. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It tells us about the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be none made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. That I say, Amen. It's the power of God. God has the cross out there. For a sign to say, stop! You're going to hell. And you need to get right. Don't continue down that path. Stop. Deal with the cross. Not only the cross, the sign, but then I believe the empty grave. The empty grave points people to this. Stop. We need to stop. People that are lost. When they hear about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, he tells them they ought to stop. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. He didn't deliver anything that he didn't receive. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he rose again 
the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas. Then of the twelve. Look at all the witnesses here that saw Christ after he rose again. Cephas, then the twelve um, disciples. That's um, the eleven and the one they voted in. Then verse 6, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. Over 500 people. Of whom the greater part remain to this present. I mean, some of them are still living when Paul wrote this here in 1 Corinthians. But some are fallen asleep. That's I'm going to be with the Lord. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Look at verse 16 and 17. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sin. Easter, Sunday morning. People go to church many times on Easter, Sunday morning. Because that's the thing to do. When they hear about the risen Lamb of God. It tells them to stop. Because it points them, yes, to the cross. He died on Calvary. He was buried and he rose again. That he's alive. He's alive. And therefore we serve a risen Savior. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. And therefore, a lost man is told once again because of the empty grave, you need to stop in your tracks. You need to stop where you are and deal with your sin. The church, the church is also telling lost man, you need to stop. You need to stop where you are. If a church is busy fulfilling the Great Commission, handing out gospel tracts, handing out brochures, handing out something, being here, being in a, in whatever, trying to get the gospel out to people, the church is a witness that there is a hell and that that lost man needs to accept Christ. The church is there for that same reason. Mark 16, 15, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Not only the cross and the empty grave and the church, but then the preaching. The preaching. Turn over to 1 Corinthians again, 121. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. You know, the world don't want to hear preaching anymore. They want to hear Joel Osteen give a positive speech. They want to hear Schuler in his last house church. Give some positive thoughts on life. Nobody wants to hear preaching anymore. They don't want to be told that they're a dirty, rotten sinner going to hell. One, in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.21 it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The foolishness of preaching. It's preaching. Every time a sinner gets underneath the preaching of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit convicts him, that's a sign. They need to stop. They need to stop. I thank God my daddy wasn't preaching the night that I got saved. It was Jim Oates. Jim Oates since then has fallen into sin. His whole family has gone to hell almost. But I thank God God used that man that time. Used that message. The preaching of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. And I got right with God. I dealt with my sin that night. And I got right with God. Because of the preaching of the Word of God. If, well, what if he went up there and they had a play that night? And they just had a singing and said, well, we're going to skip service tonight. Maybe I wouldn't be saved. Maybe I would. I don't know. All I know is I thank God for the preaching. It's preaching most of the time. Turn over to Titus 1.3. Titus 1.3. Titus chapter 1, verse 3.
Look at verse 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested, made known, is what that word means, made known, his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. Titus said it's committed unto me. i got to do the same thing. According to the commandment of God, our Savior. It's committed unto me. Paul said. Paul said, I'm, I'm committed to that. I said Titus, but I meant Paul. It's through preaching, 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 preaching. And then the scriptures. Turn over to Luke chapter 16, 29. Luke 16, 29. A lot of verses we could use here. People don't like the scriptures. Found that out a couple years ago. When I stood and said, I believe this Bible, the King James Bible, is inspired, preserved, and valuable in there. Well, that upsets people. When you know what the Word of God is. When you know what the Word of God is, then you don't have you don't have, you don't have no room to play with what, what God said. This is what God said. Luke 16, verse 29. It says, And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophet. Let them hear them. This here is the story of the rich man who died and went to hell. He died and went to hell. And if you notice this rich man, he knew the gospel. He knew the gospel. Someone must have knocked on his door. Someone must have given him a gospel tract. So he must have heard some preaching. He must have heard some preaching somewhere in the temple. He must have heard it in the synagogue. He heard it on the, on the street corner. He must have seen Jesus before because he knew the gospel. He talked about repentance. He talked about, go tell my brothers that they'll come to this awful place. He knew about Abraham. But he didn't get saved. You know why? He didn't stop. He didn't stop. He just kept going. He said, well, I can deal with that later. I got some things to straighten up in my life. I'll deal with that later. When Abraham, when he was telling Asking Abraham, Lord, uh, Abraham, send somebody to go tell my five brothers about this terrible place. Abraham's response is, no, we're not going to send somebody from the dead. They got somebody better than someone's risen from the dead. What they got is the scriptures. They have Moses and the prophets talking about the scriptures. If they don't believe this book, they're not going to believe nobody risen from no dead. This book is better than someone rising from the dead today out of the cemetery. This book is God's word. If they don't believe this book, then they're not going to believe nothing. This book tells people, stop. That's why all these other perversions want to take hell out of the Bible. They want to change it to Hades. It ain't Hades, it's hell. Right. How many people say, why don't, you, why don't you go to Hades? Nobody says that today. I sit places and eat. I hear them using the word hell, cursing. You don't ever hear anybody say Hades or shake um, Shoal. You don't ever hear anybody say those words. And they say, well, our modern Bibles are up to date. No, hell is up to date. Nobody wants to hear about hell. First sign on hell's highway is stop. Just stop before you get run over. It's too late. The second sign on hell's highway First one will stop. This one is the wrong way. Hey, you're going the wrong way. We were watching a movie one time. These idiots. Got going down the interstate one night. In the right direction, actually. And something happened. And they got all turned around because they missed something in the road, a deer or something. The car turned in, so they just kept going. Just kept going. Some people on the other side of the interstate going the same direction. They said, hey man, that people's going down the wrong way. They're going to kill someone. They haul out the window and say, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. You're going the wrong way. They looked at each other in the car and said, how do they know where we're going? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's how life is. That's what the sinner says. Oh, I want to go there. 
It's going to be a party. No, it's going to be a lake of fire. And we keep telling them through the church and through the cross and the empty grave and the preaching and the word of God, hey, you're going in the wrong direction. You're going in the wrong way. And they look at us like we're stupid and say, how do they know where we're going? But we keep telling them. It's the wrong way. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. Now we look at this other week tonight, talking about heaven. Now we're going to look at it, talking about hell. Matthew 7, 13. It says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. That's talking about hell. Look at verse 14. That's what we read reading tonight. That's talking about heaven. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Remember that was the second sign, narrow. Which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Verse 13 is talking about hell. Verse 14 is describing uh, heaven. Verse 13 is what we're going to deal with this morning, I want you to notice several things, four things. It has a wide gate. It has a wide gate. You know why? So it can accept the people that are on the wide way. The wide gate and the wide way. Can handle the crowds. Turn over to Isaiah 5.14. Isaiah 5.14. Hold your place there in Matthew. Let me tell you, I'm sorry. 514, this is what I mentioned earlier about hell hath enlarged itself. It says, therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. You can't measure. It's so wide. The gate of hell is so wide you cannot put a measuring stick on it. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. Sound like that's kind of like a high-minded person there. <laughs> Hell hath enlarged itself. You can't even measure it. That's what it says in Isaiah. It's so wide, you can't put a, 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 a measuring stick on it. You can't run down the lows and say, I want to get a 50-foot ruler. Or a 150-foot or a 200-foot. You can't measure it. It's so wide to accept the crowds. Proverbs 7, 27, 20. Turn there. Proverbs 27, 20. People are flocking there. You would think they was having a party. That's what they've been told. They've been told a lie. Say, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to drink my beer and have my girls and boy, we're just going to have a good old time with Led Zeppelin and Kiss and, and, uh, and all the rock stars and all the Hollywood people. No. They're going to be very disappointed. Proverbs 27, in verse 20. Proverbs 27, verse 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full. Never full. And, by the way, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. But hell and destruction are never full, the Bible says. Never full. Not only has it got a wide gate and a wide way, but it's the way of destruction, as we just read. It's, destruction is never full. But also in Revelation 20, verse 15, it says, Whosoever was not found in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Was cast into the lake of fire. My friend, as we tell people by Christ, we're saying, hey, you're going the wrong way. But they just keep flocking to it. You think they were going to a a major league baseball game? You think they were going to the NASCAR races? You think they were going to the NFL playoffs? The final championship Super Bowl Sunday. They just flopped by the thousands. Not only a wide gate, a wide way, the way of destruction, but the way of many. The way of many. Turn to the Revelation chapter 14 verse 20. Revelation 14, verse 20 describes those that will be killed during Armageddon. It says in verse 20, I'm going to read all the verses, 
You have to go back and read it later. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred forelongs. Now I've seen a picture of that valley. And probably you have too. It's a major place over there in the east. It's a major valley. It's a thousand six hundred forelongs. And it says that the blood is going to run all the way up to a horse's bridle. Now, is that not the thing that you put in his mouth? You put the bit in his mouth and where's that bridle? Now, I don't know what the average height of a horse is, but it's probably at least up to, I'm standing up on this platform, probably at least up to here, wouldn't you think, Brother Jack, a horse? An average horse? That's pretty pretty deep, full of blood in it. And that whole valley is going to be full of blood. Now, where's that blood coming from? From God? No. Is it coming from the saints? No, it's coming from sinners. That's going to be a great battle, and God's going to destroy them. And their blood's going to run up to the horse's bridle. Now, that place has got to be full of people. Got to be full of people. That's a lot of people dying and going to hell. That's a lot of people. Look over at Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. We'll see another great group of people that died and went to hell. Genesis 6. And these are just two things. There's the other one. Genesis 6, verse 11 and 2. No, 11 and 12. This is talking about Noah right before the flood. It says in verse 11, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Well, the only way it can be filled with violence is it's got to be filled with people. Make sense? Good. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh, all flesh, had corrupted his way upon the earth. The only people that God saved was Noah and his family. That's it. Eight people were saved. Out of the whole population of the earth, the Bible says it was filled. This time there had to be millions and millions and millions of people upon the earth by this time. It says in verse six, in verse one of chapter six. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. The earth was covered by this time with people. Millions upon millions, upon billions of people. And they all were destroyed in the flood. All went to hell just like that. And only eight people were saved. Remember narrow is the way? And wide is the game. Hey, you're going in the wrong way. You're going in the wrong way. Jesus said, hey, hell's the wrong way. I've done everything for you on Calvary. I rose again. What more can I do? He even convicts us of sin. And people still go in the wrong way. Well, we've seen the first sign. Which is stop. Seeing the second sign, the wrong way. Now the third sign this morning. This sign. There's a fire ahead. There's a fire in hell. Yeah, but Billy Graham said there wasn't. Jesus said, there's a fire in hell. Yeah, but the popular scholar said, no, they didn't. But Jesus said, there's a fire in hell. Who cares what Billy Graham said? He ain't the final authority. This book is the final authority. That's right. God's Word is. That goes back to the Scriptures. Nobody wants the Scriptures. 17 times Jesus used the word fire in the Gospels. Billy Graham just says it has flames. You ever seen a fire without a flame? You ever seen a flame without a fire? He ain't never done it. Now, now, if anybody's seen it, he would be seen it because he's 85 years old. Unless he's seen something. <laughs> but you've never seen a flame without a fire? You can't have one without the other. Every flame I've ever seen, we, we, I, I grilled out last night. I lit that thing, you know what? I saw some flame. 
you know what? I had to see some fire. <laughs> God says, Jesus said 17 times, there's fire in hell. And Billy Graham says, oh, there's no fire in hell. He calls Jesus a liar. That's right. That's what he does. He calls Jesus a liar. Jesus said there is fire in hell. He says there's no fire in hell. Turn over to Luke chapter 16. The problem with Billy Graham is he don't believe the Bible. He's become a Bible corrector instead of a Bible believer. He never was a Bible believer. He's deceived people. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. It says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of swords and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sword. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. That's a fire. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, Neither can they pass to us and would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them. He knew what testifying was. He might have been in a meeting and heard some testi testimonies. Lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. See, he knew about repentance. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Several things I just jotted down here, real quickly, in ending, that I noticed in reading this parable a couple, two or three times. First, uh, uh, I'm sorry, first off, it's not a parable. It's not a parable. You know it's not a parable because it uses people's name. Like Abraham and Moses. Lazarus. Therefore, a, a parable never uses people's names. It uses other words like they and them and he and she. But it never uses a person's name. When it's a real story, it uses people's names. This is not a parable. I had some Jehovah Witness tell me, oh, that's a parable. That's what it says. I said, oh, okay. You take your Jehovah Witness Bible and you tell me where it says it's a parable. They read, read the whole thing. The woman said, it's not a parable, is it? She didn't say it. I said, right. It's not a parable. It's a real story. That's where, that's where you're going. You're going to hell. It's not a parable. It's a real live account of someone in hell. If you notice, if you read the story, you wrote, notice that the bodies do not burn up in hell like some people tell you. Well, you're just going to be annihilated. No, they just keep burning. They just keep burning. There are torments in hell. Torments. There's pain in hell. Remember, his tongue was on fire. Torments. There's pain in hell. There's tears in hell. Notice he cried tears. He asked for mercy, but there's no mercy in hell. You know, each one of these things is telling someone, hey, there's a fire. No mercy in hell. That's over with. When a person dies and rejects Christ, there's no second chance. There's no purgatory. This is it. God's trying to warn you. There's no water in hell. Not even a drop. Can't get a drop. You'll want 
want a drop of water, though. You'll want a bucket, but it won't help. You have feelings in hell. He knew when his tongue was burning. He had feelings for his brethren. He couldn't do anything about that either. There's fire in hell, that word flame. There's a memory in hell. He knew his brothers. He remembered repentance. He remembered testifying. Abraham said, remember that thou in thy lifetime had received good things. He remembered how well he had it, how he rejected Christ. Said, hey, I'll put that off. I got plenty of time. I know someone told me to stop. I know someone told me I was going the wrong way, but I was going to wait a little bit longer. He had a memory. You'll remember this message if you die and go to hell. I believe every lost person who dies, they're going to hear every message. They will remember every verse. Their mama taught them. They will remember that King James Bible. They will remember uh, stories about heaven. They will remember songs that were sung by old saints about going to heaven and by hell and the blood. They will remember it all. That's right. It's going to haunt them for all eternity. Notice in this story, you can't leave hell. You can't get out. Not going to get out. Nobody can come to you either. You'll be all by yourself. You're not going to have a party down there. You can pray in hell. This guy prayed in hell. He asked for some things, but did his prayers get answered? No. Pray all you want. No good no more. Won't do no good. Say, oh, I'll get saved now. Too late. <coughs> Too late. Can't get saved in hell. You'll know the gospel in hell. It's already pointed out. Don't want no, you won't want no friends or families in hell either. People that die and go to hell, I don't care how bad they are. Hitler, he didn't want his family to come there as soon as he got there. As soon as he got there, he woke up and he was just like this rich man. His tongue was on fire in his body and he was in torment. And boy, he realized real quick, I don't want them people to come here. I don't want my, my, my wife to come here. I don't want my family. Marilyn Manson, when he dies one day and he goes to hell, he's not going to want his friends and he can claim he's Jesus Christ all he wants. But when he burns in hell for one second, you'll realize, I don't want none of them people come here. It's too awful. You never die in hell. You never die in hell. It's for all eternity. No beer in hell, you notice. There ain't going to be no water. There ain't going to be no beer. Ain't going to be no women down there having sex either, like some people think. fact is hell is real it's real God on the highway to hell has this sign up there's fire ahead there's fire ahead what are people doing they ignoring it they just ignoring it they care not about what's happening they want to live their life. Most people, most sinners want to live their life, not be told what to do. And that they're a sinner going to hell. Witnessing somebody the other day. They don't, they, don't, they don't care about that. They'd rather someone lie to them. Tell them they're going to heaven than to tell them the truth. That's a shame. I want someone to tell me the truth. I want someone to care enough about my soul, care about me. Tell me the truth. We've seen three signs this morning on Hell's Highway. The first one is stop. I said, stop. Stop the direction you're going. He gives us all kinds of signs. The church, the preaching, the cross, the resurrection. Can people continue. Then he says, hey, you're going in the wrong way. You, you ought to be going the other way. I know there's not many people going that direction, but I know you'll be swimming upstream. And you'll be alone. And you'll, you'll, you'll get criticized. And your family will reject you. And you'll be an outcast. And you'll be made fun of. But you're still going the wrong way. I know the crowd's going that direction. Very few are going this direction, but that's the right way. It's the narrow way, but it leads to eternal life. This one is the wrong way, it leads to destruction. 
And then if that's not enough, if, if stop and wrong way is not enough, he says, hey, there's a fire. That ought to scare you to die. Most people that run into a building on fire, they don't come out alive. That scares most people. They don't make it. They don't run in there and say, oh boy, man, look, there's a fire. Let's go have a party. Well, some of them people do that and think there's going to be a party in hell. Why don't you run into a, a, a burning house that's inflamed in fires and, oh, let's go have a party and drink a beer. Why don't they do that? They think it's going to be that much fun. The fact is it's not going to be fun. Fire is not fun. That's why God gives the road sign. It's a fire. It's a fire. And once you get there, I can't put it down. Three road signs on the highway to hell. Let's stand. I hope no one's here today that's lost, but you never know. You're lost today and need to accept Christ, then I invite you to come forward. Maybe you just need a greater burden for the lost. Maybe you need a greater burden for those that family members. Maybe you need to pray for them more. Maybe you need to come forward and pray for them. I don't know. You do whatever God asks you to do. People all around us dying. Multitudes. I showed you that in just two examples. Millions compared to eight. Up to the horses by the blood of sinners dying and going to hell. Our responsibility is to sow the seed. Sow the seed. Sow the seed. Have you sowed any seed this week? You haven't going to be up here and ask God to forgive you. You're about to do something. You ought to be doing something. Maybe you can't do as much as others, but you can do something for Christ. Tell the people, to stop. Hey, you're going the wrong way. There's a fire there. We'll be telling our friends. We'll be telling our neighbors. We'll be telling strangers. These three signs. And three more to nine, we'll give you.